Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, and then through J.C. Rao's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. On the Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some of the heads of grain, rubbing them with their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him? And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. We should notice in this passage what excessive importance hypocrites attach to trifles. We are told that one Sabbath day as Jesus is walking through some of the grain fields, his disciples broke off heads of wheat, rubbed off the husks with their hands, and ate the grains. At once the hypocritical Pharisees found fault and charged them with committing a sin. They said, Why do you do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? The mere act of plucking heads of wheat, of course, they did not find fault with. It was an action sanctioned by the Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy 23.25. The supposed fault with which they were charging the disciples was the breach of the fourth commandment. They had done work on the Sabbath by taking and eating a handful of food. This exaggerated zeal of the Pharisees about the Sabbath, we must remember, did not extend to other plain commands of God. It is evident from many expressions in the Gospels that these very men, who pretended such strictness on one little point, were more than lax and indifferent about other points of infinitely greater importance. While they stretched the commandment about the Sabbath beyond its true meaning, they openly trampled on the Tenth Commandment and were notorious for covetousness. Luke 16.14 But this is precisely the character of the hypocrite. To use our Lord's illustration, in some things he makes fuss about straining out in his cup a gnat, while in other things he can swallow a camel. Matthew 23, 24. It is a bad symptom of any one man's state of soul when he begins to put the second things in religion in the first place, and the first things in the second, or the things ordained of man above the things ordained by God. Let us beware of falling into this state of mind. There is something sadly wrong in our spiritual condition when the only thing we look at in others is their outward Christianity and the principal question we ask is whether they worship in our communion and use our ceremonies and serve God in our way. Do they repent of sin? Do they believe on Christ? Are they living holy lives? These are the chief points to which our attention ought to be directed. The moment we begin to place anything in religion before these things, we are in danger of becoming as thorough Pharisees as the accusers of the disciples. We should notice, secondly, in this passage, how graciously our Lord Jesus Christ pleaded the cause of his disciples and defended them against their accusers. We are told that he answered the petty objections of the Pharisees with arguments by which they were silenced, if not convinced. He did not leave his disciples to fight their battles alone. He came to the rescue and spoke for them. We have in this fact a cheering illustration of the work that Jesus is ever doing on behalf of his people. There is one we read in the Bible who is called the accuser of the brethren, who accuses them day and night, even Satan, the prince of the world, Revelation 12.10. How many grounds of accusation we give him by reason of our infirmity? How many charges he may justly lay against us before God? But let us thank God that believers have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is ever maintaining the cause of his people in heaven and continually making intercession for them. Let us take comfort in this cheering thought. Let us daily rest our souls on the recollection of our great friend in heaven. Let our morning and evening prayer continually be, Answer for me, answer for me, O Lord my God. We should notice, lastly, in these verses, the clear light which our Lord Jesus Christ throws on the real requirements of the fourth commandment. 
He tells the hypocritical Pharisees, who pretend to such strictness in their observance of the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was never intended to prevent works of necessity. He reminds them how David himself, when suffering from hunger, took and ate the showbread, which ought only to be eaten by the priests, and how the act was evidently allowed by God, because it was an act of necessity. And he argues from David's case that he who permitted his own temple rules to be infringed in cases of necessity would doubtless allow work to be done in his own Sabbath days when it was work for which there was a real need. We should weigh carefully the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ's teaching about the observance of the Sabbath, both here and in other places. We must not allow ourselves to be carried away by the common notion that the Sabbath is a mere Jewish ordinance and that it was abolished and done away by Christ. There is not a single passage of the Gospels which proves this. In every case where we find our Lord speaking upon it, he speaks against the false views of it, which were taught by the Pharisees, but not against the day itself. He cleanses and purifies the fourth commandment from the man-made additions by which the Jews had defiled it, but never declared that it was not binding on Christians. He shows that the seventh day's rest was not meant to prevent works of necessity and mercy, but he says nothing to imply that it was to pass away as a part of the ceremonial law. We live in days where anything like strict Sabbath observance is loudly denounced in some quarters as a remnant of Jewish superstition. We are boldly told by some people that to keep the Sabbath holy is legal and that to enforce the fourth commandment on Christians is going back to bondage. Let it suffice us to remember when we hear such things that assertions are not proofs and that vague talk like this has no confirmation in the word of God. Let us settle it in our minds that the fourth commandment has never been repealed by Christ and that we have no more right to break the Sabbath day under the gospel than we have to murder and to steal. The architect who repairs a building and restores it to its proper use is not the destroyer of it, but the preserver. The Savior, who redeemed the Sabbath from Jewish traditions and so frequently explained its true meaning, ought never to be regarded as the enemy of the fourth commandment. On the contrary, he has magnified it and made it honorable. Let us cling to our Sabbath as the best safeguard for our country's religion. Let us defend it against the assaults of ignorant and mistaken men who would gladly turn the day of God into a day of business and pleasure. Above all, let us each strive to keep the day holy ourselves. Much of our spiritual prosperity depends, under God, on the manner in which we employ our Sundays. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, as we think about the Pharisees who prized certain commands over others, are there sins we overlook in light of ones we deem as worse? Do we emphasize the inward working or only the external? Second, do we lean more towards thinking our sins are so great that God could not, and at least begrudgingly, would forgive us? What does this truth of Jesus being an advocate for our souls do for our hearts? And lastly, whatever your view of the Sabbath, the one option we don't have is to throw it into the wind as if it never existed. Why do we practice what we do regarding the Sabbath?